right. So, so we started with the idea of doing recon or hunting, and you were talking about how you learned some new stuff about yourself. And I had kind of gone over the idea that what I'm talking about with this meditative stuff or mindfulness um, is akin to uh, going out in the woods and to a new piece of woods and learning it. You have to be there because you don't know it till you're there and there's no way you can know yourself unless you go there. We cannot sit and think and figure it out. Um, you were in the military and did some recon and we talked about how you go and you sit and you watch and you, you learn the patterns. You don't do anything about it yet till you know what you know. Um, we talked about how the, uh, for those of you that hunt, deer hunting especially, um, or a, I guess any kind of hunting. We used to do a lot of duck hunting when I was young. And even duck hunting, you don't know where the ducks are flying until you're there. You don't know which way to look. Anybody ever duck hunt? You know, no? Louisiana thing. Um, but you gotta go and you sit in a tree. You don't know what the obstacles are till you get up, up in the tree. You don't know which limbs to cut. You don't know nothing, really. You know, so. And then you brought up a dream which is a very different thing. You, you seem different today, which is cool. You know, the less of the, that stuff. Um, and your dream you had when you were a little boy the first time and it's been recurring since then, every few years or whatever. Okay. And you were sick, had a fever, and you were at your grandmother's house. Your daddy was out of town working. You and your mom were with your grandmother. Your grandfather had died a few years before. Uh, and the dream was um, a blimp looking, tan blimp looking thing that would move over you. Just like a heart beating. And, yeah, and every time your heart would beat, it would kind of move. Yeah, taking, like going in an exact line, like it's taking over the whole Oh, grid. Okay. Yeah. And it was a either a bomb or a blimp, but it was ominous. It scared you, and you would make yourself wake up because you didn't wake up. You couldn't wake up. Okay. And you couldn't wake up. Yeah. And we talked about that time in uh, our culture, which it would have made about 1968, right? Yeah. And. Um, you know, I came up in Louisiana, y'all came up in Alabama. It was a lot of similar stuff, especially in more, more rural areas. Um, if folks are from the north, they don't really understand this. Um, but Kennedy had been assassinated. You had the Bay of Pigs. You had the Cold War really heating up. Uh, I remember my daddy uh, get these catalogs on bomb shelters. You know, I remember as a little boy uh, watching the, the news and all the Vietnam stuff going on. The hippie culture, which a lot of us were separate from, but every once in a while we go, oh, there goes a hippie. You know, <laughs> that's what they're talking about. You know. Uh, I remember my senator boyfriend, one of her boyfriends, I rode her with her down to the armory where he, got, he was going to Vietnam. And that was a scary time, especially for children, I guess, I don't know if it's any more scary for children or not. Um, you taught me to do that right there. Yeah. Standing out there by the bus. See? Yeah. It's a good life skill. Because that was a, uh, 
a period of time where we were still forming our patterns you know our expectations of the world and um, it was a very scary time for our culture and I think I said a while ago I remember we moved to um, Oklahoma, Enid, Oklahoma and seeing the tornadoes I remember I, I had a recurring dream about floods because that's what happened tonight where we were from um, where the, we'd be driving down a road and the water would just everywhere it, it didn't matter where you went the water would be coming up and stuff. Um, and there's a core sense in that dream and in the, in the one of my about the the waters for me is just some real profound anxiety and fear. Has anybody ever dreams like this at all? No. Um, yeah. But talk to your mom about it. And then we're going to do something to see if we can find out some other stuff. Uh, and this may be a good start for you because with all the breathing and the meditation is too weird. But this is very different from the, our other discussions. So I'm glad you showed up. Um, I was at my granny's house. My mother's mother, because I said my daddy was out of town working. My daddy's mother, who I call my grandmother, my granddaddy came up there. My daddy's mother was like the healer of the family, you know. And she, Miss Hyatt, she knew all about it roots in the wood. The doctrine. And, uh, yeah, the doctor. And she came up. She's the one who put all the blankets on top of me and make my feet right. Yeah. yeah. Well, is she Indian? Her mother's full blooded Indian. Yeah. Cherokee. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. used to we knew stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We used to I mean my grandma was like that. Yeah. Um we used to know which plants to go get and um, how to grow plants and have free food. She brushed her teeth with a stick mm -hmm. and snuff. Mm -hmm. Never went to a dentist in her whole life. Right. But we get fluoride, fluoride toothpaste and it, we have to go to a dentist. Yeah. And it messes with our brain. It's in the water too, you know that? <laughs> you drink it? Huh? Yeah. So did you drink it? Yeah. I don't know if there's any help for my brain, so you know. I've cut way back on it. I don't do the fluoride toothpaste no more. Baking soda. Baking soda or non fluoride toothpaste. But the what I'm you know, I was doing this thing about the sling bow I told y'all about and I'm going to go fishing and all that kind of stuff. For the last 10 years or so, I know that I have uh, been drawn back to nature. I do a garden every year. Because I, I, for 10, 15 years during my, when I thought I was a big man, I was totally, almost totally disconnected from nature. You know. Um, it's, I mean, where we're from, a lot of folks hunt and fish. But there are probably a bigger percentage of people that don't have a clue about that. There's a, I would imagine, a huge population of people that has never grown a tomato. Well, they don't really grow it. You just put it, you know, it, God does all that work. Um, and I put a video on the blog about um, bow fishing or sling bow fishing. And some of the comments I got was, ooh, oh, you know, poor fish. And, but probably last week they had a hamburger, you know. Um, you got to kill it to grill it. And where we are as a culture is we let the system grow our food and kill for us. You know, um, 
the death is happening, but somehow we don't, we're separate from it. And we collect our, we go out and collect our stuff from Publix. And it's all cellophane and pretty, and you got pieces of dead cow ass that looks real pretty in that white little piece of styrofoam in the cellophane. And a lot of it's genetically modified, you know? And we're disconnected from the real world. I noticed that yesterday when I went to Walmart and all the watermelons were the same exact size <laughs> and the same like consistency of color. I was like, I told John Lewis, I was like, I know the government's growing these in a lab, and putting chemicals in. Yeah. There ain't no way they're all just perfect. If you go to a county mountain, you go to a county mountain, they leave half of them in the field. Uh, they don't leave them in the yeah, side. Uh, yeah. And they leave the rest of them. And I ain't mad at nobody. I'm just trying to get us thinking about how disconnected we are sometimes. And um, that's why I think you're working in the garden, right? You're the garden master? It's all organic. Yeah. Of course they were. Until before I came here. Organic. It's not even really organic. I had to pick my fishing rod up in probably it's not eight hard years. Artificially yeah, yeah. organic. It's real. It's real. Yeah. And all our watermelons are different sizes. And they're supposed to. That's how, remember when we talked about the shapes a few weeks ago and how we're taught that basic shapes are perfect squares and perfect circles and perfect rectangles and from get-go. But that doesn't appear in the real world. Except maybe on accident. I guess theoretically it could. There could be a perfect square somewhere. Uh, the real world is swirly and seems chaotic but there's patterns that, uh, that lie underneath and it's all mathematically based. Um, our buildings are not built with base with real basic shapes. Our buildings have the um, the artificial shapes, rectangles and stuff, squares and angles. You know, um, any y'all ever are you, any y'all Tolkien people, Lord of the Rings people, or read about elves and anyway. If, there's some folks that really get off on reading about elven stuff. And part of, um, if you ever see any of that, a lot of their architecture is based on nature, nature shapes. And that's real cool. And I think part of the draw to that is that we find ourselves very disconnected from the real in that way. You know? And. And we don't even know it. You know, and I think last week we touched on the idea that that call, part of the it ought to be different thing that comes up up in us is that we're trapped in this um, square world. Square world, yeah. It's full of neon lights, and we live our life in the media in this illusion. You know, in the false propaganda world. Yeah. And it's a distraction and we think that's real. That, um, because when I was growing up, I was taught to, res you don't go out and just kill stuff. If you kill it, you're going to eat it. That's what, even if you don't like it, you're going to eat it because you, you know. My mom made me clean and cook a little bird. Yeah. But I was taught that kind of respect, and most of us that are lived in kind of rural places were. Um, we grew up playing with sticks. Anybody grew up, anybody steal your mama's tablespoon out of her drawer and went and dug holes with it for your G.I. Joes or whatever? But, uh, I took my mama to her uh, vacuum cleaner and made a rocket out of it. <laughs> Cherry bombs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now, like with being able to grow a tomato for some folks, that's, that's like amazing. Oh my God. You grow vegetables? You know how to turn a slingshot into a sling bow? You know how to do that? You know how to... We used to cut 
information is not it's more uncommon now than common when we were growing up at least around our folks mostly uh, everybody knew how to do stuff yeah. uh, I wonder how many guys in here know how to make a rat snare I do yep. stuff well, there, which one which kind um, the stick that's in the middle Drop it on, uh, see, flies up and then hangs on the stake. With a tree? Sapling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A tree to stick, you know, the bait on it. And there's two R-shaped sticks on one side and it works on the cat stick. But what, what is the common knowledge now? Know how to play cell phones. phones. Cell phones. Call of Duty. Apps, Call of Duty, video right. stuff. What TV show comes on when? Uh, how to work Spotify? Um, Plato's groove. Plato's groove. Who, who can fix the Wi-Fi? Who can fix the Wi-Fi? Who can hook all that stuff up? Which is fine, I guess. But it's all that stuff is is in a fictional world. It's electronic, and it's it's just little colors on a screen that put. The, together in some kind of pattern that we can confuse with what's real. You know? Yeah. And I think you fishing is a spiritual thing. Um, definitely got away from who I was. Mm -hmm. We forget that. We lose it. And Numb myself, numb myself, numb myself. Well, I'm guessing that this, whatever this is about, is what motivates the drug use. But, mm -hmm. Not that necessarily that particular dream or whatever, but your soul keeps showing you that picture every once in a while yeah. of this ominous threat. You said it, you associated it with death or the end of time. Yeah. Uh, That's what it is, man. Or going to hurt my loved ones or, or something like that. Just terror. Yeah. Martians, is that what you say? Might be. What? I'm going to tell you more about my life here. Okay. Well, you got anything in particular? Well, I mean, like, you know, when I grew up, we didn't have nothing. We were just like everybody else, you know. And uh, like I told you, my daddy went down to Slidell in 1970. Got a contract cutting up drag lines where they were cranes that loaded cargo on these ships. For the metal? And he had an overseas contract. He went from, he went from like rags to riches overnight. Then he went to coal mine business and everything he touched turned to money for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Until I was out of high school. And, uh, yeah, he was he had like seven coal mines, two trucking companies, an antimony mine in Central America. I was told I'd never had to break a sweat unless I wanted to. You know. But I wasn't no spoiled little brat like that. I still got friends that I had, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I guess all that comes into play too. I don't know how or what, but. Your daddy played the game and won it big. But you didn't really know him. Yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, he's gone. You can't know him. Yeah, yeah I still find out stuff about my dad that I didn't even, that I never knew when he was alive. I mean, I knew him. I knew him as far as that goes. I mean, he's my hero, you know. But uh, I find out stuff from people that he's helped since he's been gone that I never knew. He worked with a lot of people. Oh. Can you do something for me? Or for you? Um, just close your eyes and breathe a little bit. Just practice. Y'all can do it with him if you want.
and breathe all the way down in your belly. Slow and easy. And have your inhale motion be the same um, as your exhale. Just slow and easy. And um, feel the air coming in kind of cool. And as you exhale, you'll notice that it's kind of warm and moist as it moves in and out of your lungs, supplying oxygen to you. You can feel yourself relax. Just notice that your body um, may start to feel a little heavier, like almost like the chair's pushing up on you rather than you pushing down on you. Pay attention to your forehead and your temples and just let them relax. Tell them to relax. Just ease. And your cheek muscles and your neck and your chest. Just feel all that anxiety start to run out your arms toward the end of your fingertips. And breathe. And if you get a thought runs across your mind, just notice it and let it go. Let your chest and your belly and your back relax. And just observe it like you're sitting on a stand watching yourself and your body. And just observe what goes through your mind and how you feel. Relax your, your butt and your, your, your thighs. And you can feel more anxiety just running out your legs. down your calves and your shins and out the end of your toes. Just breathe and enjoy that for a little bit. You don't have to do nothing here. You don't have to think nothing here. You can just be. It's a place where the senses don't rule you. You may observe yourself a little differently than you have in the past. Some of you may have some uh, feeling of this is different. <laughs> now, brother, I'm gonna, I mean, you're going to talk, but I don't want you, I just want you to stay like you are and we can just talk, okay? As you're relaxed, remember the dream again and there's a part of the dream it's kind of associated with your ego and how you see yourself probably the part of the dream that's looking up at this ominous blimp thing and every time your heart beats boom boom it moves boom boom it moves Is there anything else that you remember about that dream? Kind of like I'm above the earth. That you're above the earth? Kind of, yeah. And the blue. Okay. You to do, ask you to do something that's a little weird, but that's you know that's what I do. I want you to think about, not think about. I want you to become the blimp, looking down on the little boy. Does that make sense? Uh, I want you to see what the blimp sees as best you can. And just let it come, because there may be uh, an impulse to try to think about it in the front of your brain. That's not what I'm talking, just let, you're looking for stuff that's coming from more deep down in you in the back of your brain.
What is the blimp feeling? Or thinking, what does it want? But you're the blimp, so... I can't hardly picture it. <coughs> How does it feel being there above the earth, looking down? It feels like... Beat it. What? Just showing that it that it's covering everything. That it's over everything. And if you don't do right, what? Take me away. Kill you? Are you feeling like you want to wake up now? Or is it kind of interesting being there? Kind of Because that's a part of your soul that's been there a long, long time. It's a part of you, right? What does the blimp want to say to that boy? Yeah. How do you think that the way you've lived your life is similar to that dream? It's omnipresent everywhere and moves with your heart. Um, is there a sense in which you basically flipped off the blimp all your life? Defied it in some ways? Maybe. And you prove to it that uh, you ain't scared? Feel that fear right now, or is it gone? It's gone. <laughs> so I don't know what we got, but on the on the video, but. Uh,
But I think for many of us, learning the easy, soft path is the way to go. You know? Um, getting dis reconnected with what's real. Grandma's house. Um, the kitchen matches lighting and the, and the sound of the poof. Yes, so. Seeing the, anybody ever seen it rain fish? That's where I'm from. Huh? That's where I'm from down over the coast. Yeah, that's where I saw it. Orange beach. I saw it in my grandma's yard in central Louisiana. Little brim and little bass flopping in the yard. Running and playing in the ditches when they're full of water. Yeah. Uh -huh. Smell another Louisiana. What do you mean, fish? Hmm? Uh, the oily fish. It was raining fish. Yeah, hey, literally raining fish. What is it, like eggs evaporate or something? No, the storms will go over the lakes and suck up a little fish in the clouds and drop them. What like, would? Storms. Like the water spout. Like the water out there in that lake is being evaporated when it goes into the clouds. It pulls the little fish up so strong. But, and all this is not about religion. It's not about figuring nothing out. I think it's about connecting again with what's real. You know, turning off the TV a minute, turning off our addictions a minute. Because when you're in that place that you got, you don't need no drugs. You don't need anybody, really. It's just in our anxiety that we need something or somebody or we start worrying about how to fix stuff that we many times have no control over. Being still and knowing that I'm God. You know? And it's okay to go and do and laugh and play and try to figure stuff out. Because um, that's kind of the fun of it. You know, but resist the temptation of thinking that figuring it out is the real. Because even if we figure it out as best we could and become the most profound philosopher or whatever, um, we still only see in part and know in part. We're never going to know the truth with our ego. Do you think we look at it like a game that we're trying to win? Yeah. It's a game. It's a serious game sometimes. But just the simple, simple stuff, because a lot of y'all have rural roots, Indian, Cherokee, whatever roots. Uh, my roots range from Cherokee Indian to Scottish and English and French, Kunas French. And all of our roots go way deep into the land and the earth. All right, and some of y'all just need to take your shoes off and go walk in that grass. Yeah, walk through the garden. Walk through the garden. Pull up a weed every once in a while or something. It gets muddy out there. It feels good. You know. You talk about digging in the ground with a spoon. I was picturing that. I smell that of uh, that old bank out there. The bottle dump. I dig those bottles and I smell that smell come out. Did y'all hear what he's talking about? Having this conversation is stirring up stuff in you, real stuff. That's what I wanted to do all weekend was just like put my feet in some sand. Cause the it water me, it reminded me of when I used to go to my my, my dad's uh, side of the family down in the country, and we used to go to the creek. That cold water and that catching sand, crawfish, sandy dirt. Mm -hmm. And, and if you played in the dirt when you were little, and some of you young folks never have done that, and you're scared of grasshoppers. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of folks are. Scared of grasshoppers? Scared of anything outdoors. Go out there in the well, catch some big old black grasshoppers. Yeah, black and red ones, black and um, But the dirt where I grew up probably has a different smell than the dirt where you grew up. It does, because I remember smelling that. 
Louisiana. Well, that's the Bayou Mother. Yeah. Um, I do remember that. It's but the smell of oak woods where the red, where the earthworms are, right under the leaves and stuff like that. Um, the taste of new potatoes. Any y'all ever y'all like new potatoes? The ones in the grocery store, they, they're just bland and stuff. But if you grow new potatoes here and new potatoes back where I'm from, they're going to taste different. Because they have different compositions in the soil. Um, so, maybe that, for whatever reason, this is where we ended up. In your dream, all this stuff may have just been to get your attention, but the issue was being disconnected and floating between the earth and heaven. You know? And you've talked about how just fishing has started to ground you a little bit. So, so anyway, I hope that something did meditate on this week. Peace out, my crackers. I remember going to the restaurant, didn't order anything, wanted seafood.